The language we use every day, in many ways, shapes the way we perceive the world. People in positions of power have understood this truth since the beginning of history, and have always changed at least some of the words we use in order to serve their ends. People are intimately tied to words in the same way in which we are intimately tied to places. We live in one place, work in another. Our children go to school in one place, but see their doctor in another. The spaces we navigate through contain buildings, streets, monuments, rivers, mountains and valleys, all of which require place names if we are to make sense of our day-to-day -day environment. If you could somehow dictate what people call these places, you will gain a great degree of control over them because you will have the power to manipulate two things which are so very tightly knitted into the fabric of the human psyche, language and places. History is rife with examples. New Amsterdam and New Amsfort became anglicized to New York and Brooklyn. St. Petersburg and Volgograd Bolshevized to Leningrad and Stalingrad. The Republic of China is called Taiwan. And recently, Mount McKinley, the highest peak in North America, was renamed Denali. One of the best documented, most organized, complete and thorough name-changing operations in history took place in Turkey after World War I under Mustafa Kemal Ataturk's reformist government. But the policy actually had its beginnings back during Ottoman times. Beginning in 1880, the name Armenia was forbidden to be used in official Ottoman documents in an attempt to censor the history of Armenians in their own homeland. Sultan Abdul Hamid II, nicknamed the Bloody Sultan in the West due to the hundreds of thousands of Greeks and Armenians he massacred, replaced the name Armenia with such terms as Kurdistan or Anatolia. The idea was that there would be no Armenian question if there was no Armenia. The process of quote-unquote nationalization of place names was continued by the Kemalist regime under Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, and in 1923, the entire territory of Armenia was officially renamed Eastern Anatolia. This name is especially confusing because the word Anatolia means sunrise or east in the Greek language. Anatolia is what the ancient Greeks called the Asia Minor Peninsula long before the arrival of Turkic people, since it was east of the Greek mainland. So, Eastern Anatolia literally translates to Eastern East, which is clearly redundant and absurd. During the Ottoman era, the term Anatolia, or Anadolu, expanded to include the eastern stretches of Asia Minor. However, the numerous European, Ottoman, Armenian, Russian, Persian, Arabic, and other primary sources did not confuse the term Armenia with Anatolia. This testifies to the fact that even after the loss of its statehood, the Armenian nation still constituted a majority in its homeland, which was recognized by Ottoman occupiers as well. Historically, the Armenian highlands have been situated to the east of Anatolia, with the border between them located near Sivas, or Sebastia, and Kayseri, or Kaysaria. Therefore, it is incorrect to refer to Armenia as part of Eastern Anatolia, because it was never a part of Anatolia to begin with. Armenia, together with its boundaries, was unequivocally mentioned in the works of earlier Ottoman historians and chroniclers until the end of the 19th century. Khatib Chelebi, a famous Ottoman chronicler of the 17th century, had a special chapter titled about the country called Armenia, in his book, Jihan Numa. However, when this book was republished in 1957, its modern Turkish editor, H. Selin, changed the title into Eastern Anatolia. Osman Nuri, a Turkish historian of the second half of the 19th century, mentions Armenia repeatedly in his three-volume Abdul Hamid and the period of his reign. In the 1960s, Turkey went so far as to successfully pressure the Swiss airline company, Swiss Air, to remove the nomenclature 
Armenian plateau from the maps provided by their plains. Eastern Anatolia was formalized and cemented as a place name during the first Geography Congress of Turkey in 1941, which divided Turkey into seven geographic regions. But why doesn't it make sense to include Armenia as part of Anatolia? Why should we even have a separate place name for this region anyway? Well, in order to answer such questions, let's examine the layout of this region. Now suppose we didn't know anything about the cultures in and around this area, and we wanted to draw some boundaries based strictly on physical features. We see a fairly prominent mountain range here. In fact, Europe's tallest peak, Mount Elbrus, is part of this range. These are the Caucasus. This strip of coastline here along the Mediterranean is distinctly wetter, greener, and a little more hilly than its adjacent areas. Not surprisingly, this region hosts an immense cultural heritage dating back millennia. We call this region the Levant. We see another prominent mountain range here, although not nearly as tall as the Caucasus. These are the Zagros Mountains, the historic barrier between Iran and the region to its west. Mesopotamia, or the land between two rivers, shown here. Here we have the Anatolian Peninsula, surrounded by water on all three sides. And the region here is largely uninhabited due to its arid climate and lack of surface water, a feature which extends all the way down across the Arabian Peninsula. So the question we're building up to, of course, is what do we call this region in the middle? This region is also distinct, mainly because of its altitude profile, which is made clear when a line is drawn across Anatolia, showing its elevation profile and highlighting the Armenian plateau. Inside of this blue circle is a rugged highland region containing snow-capped mountains, fast-flowing streams, high plains, deep canyons, and steep gorges, all elevated as a plateau above its surrounding regions. In fact, without these mountains, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers would not exist as they are. It is snowmelt from this region which feeds the two rivers. Now, including this region as part of the Anatolian Peninsula does not make much sense since it is not even on the peninsula. It's closer to the Caspian Sea than the Mediterranean. And so this is yet one more important reason why not to call this place Eastern Anatolia. It is not part of Anatolia. So what do we call this region if it's not the Middle East, not the Caucasus, not Anatolia? Before the Turkish revisionist era, this region was called by everyone the Armenian Highlands, the Armenian Plateau, or the Armenian Mountains because the indigenous ethnic Armenian homeland happens to fall squarely within its boundaries, which is no coincidence either. Physical regions generally tend to correspond to cultural regions. When I was a college student, during a history class one day, one of my professors actually called this place the Armenian Mountains, and I remember my head sprung up with intrigue. I had never heard anyone use the term. Later I realized how old he was, and it made sense. He was 80 years old in 2007, so the sources he studied probably came from the time before the name change. Let us go back to the height of World War I and during the final years of the Ottoman Empire, when the ethnic cleansing policies of non-Muslim Greek, Armenian, and Assyrian minorities were underway. Minister of War Enver Pasha issued an edict, or ferman, on October 6, 1916, declaring, It has been decided that provinces, districts, towns, villages, mountains, and rivers, which are named in languages belonging to non-Muslim nations such as Armenian, Greek, or Bulgarian, will be renamed into Turkish. In order to benefit from this suitable moment, this aim should be achieved in due course. Hussein Avni Alparslan, a Turkish soldier and author of books about Turkish language and culture, 
was inspired by the efforts of Enver Pasha, writing in his book, If we want to be the owner of our country, then we should turn even the name of the smallest village into Turkish and not leave its Armenian, Greek, or Arabic variants. Only in this way can we paint our country with its colors. Long after World War I, during the Republican era, under the authority of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, imported maps containing references to historical regions such as Armenia, Kurdistan, or Lazistan were prohibited. By 1927, all street and square names in Istanbul, which were not of Turkish origin, were changed. Journalist and writer Aisha Hür has noted that after the death of Ataturk and during the democratic period of the Turkish Republic in the late 1940s and 50s, quote, village names with lexical components meaning red, bell, church, were changed. To do away with separatist notions, the Arabic, Persian, Armenian, Kurdish, Georgian, Tatar, Circassian, and Laz village names were also changed." End quote. The Special Commission for Name Change was created in 1952 under the supervision of the Ministry of the Interior. It was invested with the power to change all names that were not within the jurisdiction of the municipalities like streets, parks, or places. In the commission were representatives from the Turkish Language Society, from the faculties of Geography, Language, and History at Ankara University, the Military General Staff and Ministries of Defense, Internal Affairs, and Education. The committee was working until 1978 and 35% of the villages in Turkey got their names changed. The initiative proved successful, as approximately 28,000 topographic names were changed, including over 12,000 village and town names, and 4,000 mountain, river, and other topographic names. This figure also included names of streets, monuments, quarters, neighborhoods, and other components that made up certain municipalities. At the culmination of the policy, no geographical or topographical names of non-Turkish origin remained. Some of the newer names resembled their native names, but with revised Turkish connotations. For example, Akhtamar was changed to Akdamar. And so, in this way, the Ottoman and later Turkish authorities not only physically removed non-Islamic people off their soil, but also wiped clean any linguistic evidence that might have suggested these lands were once occupied by different people, by indigenous people. It could be argued that the Greek and Armenian genocide continued long after the last Greeks and Armenians were slaughtered, extending into the modern age in the form of a cultural genocide. The lengths that the Turkish government went to in order to change so many place names should give us an idea of how important place names are. Place names hold a deep, primal, powerful position in the human psyche, something that the Turkish authorities understood very well 